Let's check out this clip from this news anchor who calls himself a meteorologist, yet he doesn't really know what a meteor is. Being a meteorologist has got nothing to do with meteors. Hello everyone, welcome to another Creaky Blinder video. Um, today we're going to be looking at Feed Your Mind 2. And if this is what feeding your mind does, I think I'd rather let mine starve. How's it going out there? This is Feed Your Mind and so meteors are not what you were told. Meteorologists are definitely not what you've been told. And in this video, I will show you the evidence that I've come up with. And at the risk of sounding skeptical, which really isn't what I want to sound, I thought I'd have a quick glance through Feed Your Mind 2's channel. And it's a smorgasbord of nonsense. Clearly he's a flat earther. He's also a dinosaur denier. He's got titles on his channel such as the secret history of the Bible finally revealed. Proof space programs are not what you were told. Globe Earth loses in court versus Flat Earth. Proof Earth is not what you were told. And so on and so forth. But that begs the question, how can we all be so wrong and feed your mind to so right? Well, throughout history, meteors used to be called shooting stars. Well, I'm impressed. Meteors are also known as shooting stars, but they only become a meteor once they pass through the Earth's atmosphere and vaporize, hence the trail of light. Now, a meteorite, on the other hand, is also part of a meteoroid, but in the case of a meteorite, it successfully passes through the Earth's atmosphere without vaporizing. So it doesn't become a meteor, it becomes a meteorite and impacts the surface of the Earth or the sea or anywhere else it happens to land. Science stuff. And it was said that if you wish upon a shooting star and it comes true. Oh, come on, we were doing so well. Up until you said wish upon a shooting star, everything you've said has been actually quite factual. Scientifically, people believe that meteors are pieces of rock that broke off from a comet or asteroid that's flying through the air. But conveniently, most of these meteors burn up in the sky before they even touch ground, so... Oh yeah, too right, it's convenient. <laughs> because some of these objects are bloody massive. For example, the Reed Fort crater, an asteroid impact that happened 2 billion years ago in South Africa, which was 118 miles or 190 kilometers for all my American friends, in diameter or a crop, whatever, it doesn't matter. It was bloody big. So yeah, too right is convenient that they burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Because if something that size was to strike our, <laughs> our planet, it will be good night, Irene. And so a meteor is a comet, or is it an asteroid, or is it a meteoroid, or is it a meteorite, or is it a meteor? For one thing to have so many names begins to make me question if maybe that's a clue that they're not related items. <laughs> no, there's no clue at all. I've already partially explained this. A comet, an asteroid, a meteoroid, a meteor, a meteorite. They're all variations of very similar things. It's just how it behaves and what happens to it determines what it's called. Why am I bothering? Because you're not going to believe me anyway. We'll get into much more detail in this video, but before we get started, let's check out this clip from this news anchor who calls himself a meteorologist, yet he doesn't really know what a meteor is. And it was from this point on that we knew that anything Feed Your Mind 2 says was... <laughs> That's a load of old crap. A meteorologist <laughs> studies the weather. You knob G. <laughs> Track those, uh, those meteors as we think that they are. Those meteors as we think that they are. Oh, there it, is. it looks like a, a rocket exploding or like a rocket taking mm -hmm. off right. or something. The that is so amazing. And the then fizzles away. That's what I can't understand. Why does it just fizzle away the way we're going to see it fizzle? Okay, now I'm not entirely sure if fizzle is the correct terminology. <laughs> but 
but that's passing through the Earth's atmosphere. And the reason it's fading away is because it's vaporizing. <laughs> And the fact that they're not sure if it's a meteor or a meteorite doesn't mean that meteorologists <laughs> don't know anything about meteors, because why would they? <laughs> they're experts in predicting the weather and studying the weather. <laughs> so when a meteor is flying around in space, it's called a meteoroid, and a meteoroid is said to be a piece of a comet that had broke off, and it also can be a piece of an asteroid that broke off. And so science is saying that asteroids and comets were formed around the time of the Big Bang, where there was all types of chaos in outer space, and all types of planets were crashing into each other, and everything was just smashing into each other, creating these asteroids, and the comets were forming from debris and stuff stuff like that and so when the meteoroid enters earth's atmosphere it starts flaming up and stuff that's considered a meteor and then whenever a meteor is discovered on the earth's surface it has now become a meteorite <clears throat> i'm starting to feel a little bit uncomfortable because in fairness everything he said so far except for the comment about meteorologists being the people that study meteors has been right and so meteor impact sites are said to mostly occur in remote areas conveniently. I mean, we're talking about open waters and uninhabited forests. This is all said to be pretty much microscopic fragments of a meteorite if ever found at all. So, and like I said, once they are found, it's mostly made of rock anyways. So your problem with meteorites and meteors is that they don't do enough damage? And so it's very rare to find a meteorite, but if you do find one, it is said to be a burnt looking rock. But just because somebody finds a burnt looking rock, does that mean it came from outer space? Well, no, clearly not. Not in every case. You know, if you're in the forest, you stumble across a burnt looking rock. Maybe somebody was having a barbecue. <laughs> And so we're finding such small fragments of meteorites here on Earth is such a rare thing. Then how does that explain the larger meteor impact sites? But that doesn't make much sense at all, or at least it doesn't to me. Little rocks and big rocks don't necessarily go together. It's not like a family of rocks, is it? So let's begin this investigation with the moon. I mean, if you look at the moon, you're going to notice that the moon is just filled with what looks like crater impacts. Now, I know this is going to seem like I'm split in hairs. <laughs> but the crater isn't the impact. The crater is the result of the impact. But please, do go on. From what you would suppose is some type of consistent meteor impacts hitting the moon but really we don't ever see any activity of meteors hitting the moon well consistent may be a little bit of a stretch but the reason there are so many craters on the moon is really quite simple it's because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere earth is protected by its atmosphere the moon's not got one so of course you're going to see a lot more craters on the surface of the moon Duh. And another reason, because I'm feeling a bit sciencey today, that there are far more craters visible on the moon than there are on Earth, is as follows. Because the moon lacks water, as well as an atmosphere. And because on Earth, we've got erosion, it makes it more difficult to recognize craters that are on Earth. And there are craters on Earth, but most of them that happened millions, dare I go as far as say, billions of years ago, have been eroded away. And also, there's no tectonic activity on the moon. Try saying that after you've had five pints of lager. So these are the three reasons why craters are so visible on the moon and not on Earth. Science. Thank you, Google. Nobody will ever know. That makes me so happy. You're most welcome. Oh shit, the camera's on. <laughs> And so with the moon appearing to have so much activity happen, it's pretty interesting that all of this activity all of a sudden stopped. I'm sure scientists will say something like, that was from all of the activity from around the time of the Big Bang. So let's consider some other factors. And so what would be the chances of every single crater on the moon being a straight 
downward impact. You don't see anything that indicates any type of angular strikes from meteorites. Everything just is straight up and down, which is actually the same as the large impact craters on Earth. Now, when you say there are no elongated or off-round craters on the moon, you obviously mean apart from the Schiller crater and the Bowditch crater and the Messier crater and Messier A crater. You obviously mean apart from those ones, yeah? And so with every single large impact crater being a straight vertical impact, the chances of that would be pretty much impossible. So to me, that rules out that these are impact craters. Now, I'm finding it pretty difficult to believe that somebody who has clearly done a lot of reading and watched a lot of videos about this topic chooses to leave out the parts that go against his argument. It's absolutely unbelievable. <laughs> I've never come across anything like it in my life, ever. Now I know in my videos, when I when I come across a topic like this, I, I know I like to poke fun at it and, you know, because this is a comedy channel after all. <laughs> Please say it's funny. <laughs> but it does lead me to wondering, what, what's going on up here? What motivates these people to think in this way? If they're prepared to brush aside logic and reason, what exactly is their motivation? There's also passages in the Bible that suggest that when the angels fall, there could be some type of impact. Ah. And when they were gone, I ordered Ornias to be brought forward and said to him, Tell me how I know this. And he answered, Shut up. Listen, when you have to bring in another flat earther, <laughs> To strengthen your ridiculous argument, you've lost straight off the bat. So, okay, if it's your first time here, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, turn on bell notifications, and maybe, just maybe, give the video a thumbs up or a thumbs down. It's your choice. Um, it means the world to me when I see a new subscriber. So, if you do choose to subscribe after watching this video, make sure you say hello down in the comment section, and I will try and say hello back. Thanks everyone, I'm the Creaky Blinder and I will see you in the next one. Take care, bye bye.